If anyone has watched my previous videos, then they know just how much pride I take in my title as the world's most pretentious man. What was only briefly mentioned in my intro video, though, were specific examples of what sorts of YouTube essayists I most appreciate. One example that I provided was Mr. Beatung, famous for his upload of Mass Effect 3 ending, tasteful, understated nerd rage. If you've listened to all of Mr. Beatung's videos like I have, then you know that he really, really likes cyberpunk. As it so happens, I also really, really like cyberpunk. As in, I like cyberpunk enough that earlier this autumn, I wrote a 10-page academic paper illustrating how changes in cyberpunk fiction can be used to observe the manner in which a man's cultural subconscious gradually adapts to the information age. This wasn't even required for my relevant class at the time. The professor had only asked for a brief essay response to our reading of William Gibson's Neuromancer. So, because this is one of the few college essays I'm genuinely proud of, and because I want to shamelessly pander to one of the essayists who has influenced me ever since I was in late middle school, I present the aforementioned essay, now in auditory format. Countercultural Shifts How Cyberpunk Illustrates the Psyche of Man Entering the Post Man Era. Can each decade's take on the storytelling genre of cyberpunk illustrate man's changing attitude towards his technology? Could it even be that the individualized patterns of human psychology can be observed on the macro scale through such an exploration? Well, to each literary genre, there is a theme which pervades its essence. The adventure story shall forever permeate self-discovery, the horror story shall forever permeate the unknown, and the comedic story shall forever permeate life's incongruities. To the genre of cyberpunk, this most central constant is the impact which technologies impose upon humanity. These genres cannot be mistaken as existing in stasis, however. The presence of these uniform themes is not unmoving, but rather unconventional. They, as culture advances, move so too into these new advancements, unmaking and remaking themselves from what they were into what they shall be within the new manifestations of a new time, reflective of this new time itself. One must wonder, though, from what basis did these constant yet emergent genre themes surface forth? In most cases, the answer is that the first stories to codify these genres serve to also codify their most consistent themes. Just as it should be no surprise that horror's thematic emphasis upon the unknown permeates within this genre which was codified by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it should, in turn, be no surprise that cyberpunk's thematic emphasis upon the impact which technologies impose upon humanity permeates this genre which was codified by William Gibson's Neuromancer. It follows, then, that this aforementioned argument can indeed be made, that by comparing the cyberpunk of decades following Neuromancer, one can find out exactly how our modern world has changed her attitudes towards technology over time. The method by which each decade's cyberpunk shall be compared follows thus. A prominent work of that decade will be chosen by looking at the most popular cyberpunk works of that decade and choosing one as a case study, the selection being made through a balance of media popularity against author familiarity. For sake of brevity, this selection process will not be detailed in each instance. Rather, all which shall be mentioned is which work was chosen to be the case study for that respective decade in cyberpunk. Once a work has been specified for the according decade, the core aspects of that story's composition shall be outlined in order for comparison, aspects such as their main character's literary archetype, the literary tone, their symbolic imagery, and ultimately their thematic attitude towards the intersection of man and technology. For obvious reasons, the first work which must be dissected in such a manner is Neuromancer. To the matter of main character archetypes, Neuromancer's case is unquestionably a classical anti-hero. Being a thief, a murderer, a junkie, a criminal, and overall self-serving, yet still remaining somehow respectable in his goals as he persistently marches forward. To the matter of symbolic imagery, it is Case's shuriken which is often regarded as the most significant literary symbol within Neuromancer, typically taken to represent the past both for Case and for the world around him, as it is not only the sole old world piece of technology which Case carries, but is also a souvenir of Case's own past. To the matter of literary tone, Neuromancer positively drenches its reader in the atmosphere of counterculture, dark scenery, hallucinogenic needs, anti-authority leanings, approval of crime, 
and general statelessness permeate through every page of the book. To the matter of thematic attitudes towards man and technology, one particular word must be emphasized when saying that Neuromancer imposes the idea that scientific advancements will blur the line between man and technology, that in time technologies like the cyberspace, the cybernetic implants, and the artificial intelligences are inevitable, inevitably destined to mystify this distinction. So, in totality, Neuromancer places a classical anti-hero into a world of counterculture where he constantly carries a symbol of the past as he is faced with events which show that the line between man and technology will be blurred. Looking at the story under this lens of analysis, one might reasonably conclude that it indicates a cultural era which was dismissive of the idea that man and technology can converge as Neuromancer fits the need to base itself in underground culture and none-too-humane protagonist before it was able to propose that this idea will surface in the future, while even then still centering its most prominent literary symbol around the idea of a more human past. Neuromancer shows that the developed world's culture of the 1980s brushed aside the idea of man and technology merging together. Then, following the 1980s era of Russia and Reaganomics, there came the 1990s era of Nirvana and NAFTA. It was from this cultural pool that the Wachowskis' The Matrix emerged. Not only is The Matrix most decidedly cyberpunk, being set in an oppressive world with an underground subculture of lawless hackers, but its very name is owed to Neuromancer, as this connotation of the word Matrix was coined by that book. William Gibson himself is quoted as saying that the Matrix is arguably the ultimate cyberpunk artifact. Yet, as previously established, this progression of the genre is not a stagnation of it, despite remaining based on the intersection of man and technology. The most key difference is in the movie's thematic attitude towards this intersection, in that The Matrix posits that its audience's contemporary world is one in which the line between man and technology HAS been blurred. In order to illustrate this, let us proceed in our dissection of the story's composition. To the matter of the work's tone, the Matrix swathes every frame of its film with a sense of coldness, from its desaturated color palette to its environment of grid-like monoliths to its surrounding decay. One cannot watch The Matrix without feeling at least a slight shiver down their spine. To the matter of symbolic imagery, the significance of the spoon within The Matrix is so culturally resonant that the scene in question has been widely parodied. The specific idea which is represented by the spoon is the notion of perception as illusion, the specific idea that it is the first object of this illusory world which our protagonist is able to manipulate by focusing on his illusory perception of it, rather than by focusing on the thing itself. Amidst these seemingly cynical elements, though, there is a counterbalance for the coldness and illusions that being the archetypes of the Matrix's main character. The protagonist of this story is named Neo, and though his character displays many elements of the everyman, it is most accurate to compare him to the Messiah in terms of literary archetypes. Neo is seemingly spontaneously born from a womb-shaped incubator, his virgin birth. He then finds himself with a group of people devoted to the idea that he is, as they put it, the One, these being his disciples. With one particular member of this group, Morpheus, being exceptionally fervent in his declaration of Neo as the One, his John the Baptist. Only for one of those in his group, Cypher, to betray them in exchange for payment from their oppressors, his Judas. Yet later, Neo actively chooses to sacrifice himself for the rest of humanity by placing himself at the mercy of these oppressors in his crucifixion of sorts, only to be revived exactly three minutes later by the love of a character named Trinity, his resurrection, following which he becomes so unassailable as to render him incandescent while he faces off against the forces which oppose the love that revived him. Finally, the movie ends on a shot of Neo literally flying upwards, his ascension. From how totally this movie commits itself to the idea that Neo, who, as previously stated, has many elements of the everyman, lives in a world which is itself a simulation, 
it can be concluded that the cultural era which produced this film is one in which the potentiality of the line between man and technology having been blurred is at least somewhat accepted. Yet, by the tone of coldness with which this story of a man's intersection in technology is approached, and with the symbolic emphasis towards all of this as being illusory, it could also be concluded that this story comes from a cultural era which was, at best, reticent in its acceptance of the line between man and technology having been blurred. When the main character's literary archetype is taken into equation, the picture becomes much more clear, however. The fact that audiences responded so positively to this movie with Neo as an everyman-turned-messiah indicates a culture in which each man wanted to see himself as the exception to the transformation they could see happening around them. That even as they witnessed the emergence of email, of cell phones, of CDs, and of ATMs, they wished to still remain the man who could, quote-unquote, save other men from the, quote-unquote, dangers of getting, quote-unquote, too close to technology. When looking to the kind of cultural attitudes this displays, and comparing it to the cultural attitudes displayed by Neuromancer, it can be most succinctly summarized that the difference in regard for the intersection of man and technology between the 1980s and the 1990s is, much like The Matrix's own tone, one of cold acceptance. Acknowledgement that this is the state of the world, but refusal to entertain its impact on the self. Did this cold acceptance carry itself into the next decade, though? The 2000s were the decade of texting and terrorism, a cultural trend reflected by Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of the Patriots, given its plot of terrorists acting as a cover for a plot to control the internet. This idea of higher powers attempting to exact mass control through hidden processes is reflected also in the game's most prominent symbolic imagery, in that most of the game takes place inside the S3 simulation, which is in and of itself a literary symbol for control, on scales both macro and micro. On the micro scale, it is the tool being used to control the will of our protagonist Raiden. You want to control human thought? Human behavior? Of course. Anything can be quantified nowadays. That's what this exercise was designed to prove. You fell in love with me just as you were meant to after all. Isn't that right, Jack? As seen in the above quote, S3 is not only controlling Raiden's will, but it is implied to have even been behind his falling in love. Meanwhile, on the macro scale, S3 is also the tool being used to control the will of the masses. S3 plan does not stand for solid snake simulation. What it does stand for is selection for societal sanity. The S3 is a system for controlling human will and consciousness. S3 is not you, a soldier trained in the image of solid snake. It is a method, a protocol that created a circumstance that made you what you are. So you see, we're the S3, not you. What you experienced was the final test of its effectiveness. That's crazy! You heard what President Johnson said. The Arsenal's GW system is the key to their supremacy. The objective of this exercise was to establish such a method. Unsurprisingly, such writing made for a literary tone which was, above all else, foreboding. Strange curiosities, barraged questions, dreadful urgency, mounting heartbreak, and personal anxieties dominate this narrative in such a manner as to impose a preeminent sense of foreboding. It is perhaps surprising, then, or, inversely unsurprising, depending on one's viewpoint, that Raiden all but perfectly fits into the literary archetype of the audience surrogate. Raiden comes into the events of Sons of Liberty just after having lived through a simulation of the events of Metal Gear Solid, the game which Sons of Liberty was a sequel to, and which most players likely played just before booting up Sons of Liberty. He desperately wishes that he could be Solid Snake, the action hero protagonist of the first game, but cannot escape the fact that the examples of aggrandized heroes can never be fully lived up to, 
just as the player cannot escape the fact that these examples, which they have likely expected to live out upon booting up a Metal Gear Solid sequel, can never be fully lived up to. Those in control of the simulation ultimately reveal to Raiden that it was this psychological need to live out a hero fantasy of his which allowed them to manipulate him. Just as the drive to live out a fantasy is what drove the player to keep playing even as the events of the game's plot grew more gruesome, so, from this tale of an audience surrogate being secretly controlled via a simulation as he is forced through increasingly foreboding incidents within this simulation, one can conclude that it is the product of a decade wherein audiences were horrified of their knowledge that man and technology are now joined. This knowledge that man and technology have joined is evidenced by how complete the simulation's control of Raiden is. Even in the climax where he is believed to have escaped the S3 program, he is still unable to prevent the program's plan for control of the masses. The evidence of audience horror to this concept, more obviously, lies with the game's deeply foreboding tone. When held in direct comparison to the cultural attitudes reflected by Neuromancer, one can conclude that Sons of Liberty's tale of a single lowly man getting caught among incomprehensibly high-minded technologies displays a cultural trend towards man undergoing a very gradual emotional process of his changing world, even if this process takes decades. To the matter of decades, the final one to be placed under our newly constructed microscope of literary analysis is the 2010s. For obvious reasons, this decade shall be the most puzzling to analyze, as one cannot take an objective viewpoint to what they are currently living through. Nonetheless, we shall move forward in this analysis as we look into this decade of Putin and populism. Populism not only in the conservative sense of movements such as Brexit, but also in the liberal sense of movements such as Occupy Wall Street. When better than the era of Occupy Wall Street, then, to premiere a show which follows an insurrectionary anarchist whose goal through the show's first season is to eliminate corporate America's practice of debt slavery by erasing all financial data of the world's largest mega-conglomerate. This is referring, of course, to Sam Esmail's Mr. Robot. Within Mr. Robot, the aforementioned main character is Elliot Alderson, a late 20s loner of NYC who hates his desk job. Desk job by day, that is. Elliot's nights are spent as a vigilante hacker, progressing further and further down the rabbit hole of hacking subculture as the story continues forward. And Elliot is practically the epitome of the unreliable narrator. Elliot constantly questions his own sanity, wonders which aspects of his surrounding are or are not figments of his imagination, expresses vivid hallucinations, feels foggy when searching through his memories, and nearly always breaks the fourth wall by addressing the camera as his imaginary friend. With such a psychologically incomprehensible protagonist, it should be no surprise that the show's most prominent symbolic imagery is representative of Elliot's psyche. This imagery in question is the recurring symbolism of Elliot's pet fish named Corti. Corti is a male Siamese beta fish, the type of fish which is the most antisocial, generally tending to seek out places to hide alone. When Elliot is forced through the hallucinations of withdrawal in episode 4, it is the first time the audience can be certain that what they are seeing is indeed a window into Elliot's mind, rather than a mixture of the real and the imagined. And all of his hallucinations during this time revolve around Corti. The fact that the audience is viewing a story of societal revolution through the unreliable perspective of a psychologically convoluted character should make it no surprise that Mr. Robot's literary tone effortlessly oozes onto its viewer a sense of feverishness. Elliot's constant drive for his vigilantism communicates excitement. The overarching cynical view of our contemporary status quo communicates agitation. Each character's high level of intensity communicates obsession. The show's breakneck pacing communicates restlessness. And the ardency with which each faction fights for what they consider to be right communicates passion. All of which adds up to the show's feverish tone. So, within this feverish tale of an unreliable narrator with perplexing psychology, what is said of the intersection between man and technology? Well, the answer lies in a rather critical fact of the show's first season, which is that Elliot actually does manage to succeed in his quest to collapse corporate America's practice of debt slavery. 
he is indeed able to erase all financial data of the world's largest mega conglomerate and witnesses the cascading fallout therein. If this is shown from within the feverish story of a man such as Elliot, then one can conclude that it is most likely spawned from a cultural era wherein man has come to believe that he must rewire his world of synthesized man and technology. After all, if it took a sufficiently delirious man to rewire his surrounding world of synthesized man and technology before it could be delivered from a great evil, then does it not fall to the maniacs of our own world to do the same? Viewed in this way, Mr. Robot's proposed cultural attitudes contrast to those of Neuromancer in a way which can only be described as full circle, wherein man once scoffed at the idea of a world where technology and man are intrinsically joined, he now embraces it for the empowerment provided by a world which can be rewired. So, in summary, Neuromancer shows the 1980s as a decade wherein man was dismissive of the notion that the line between technology and humanity would be blurred. The Matrix showed the 1990s as a decade wherein man was cold towards the acceptance of the fact that the line between technology and humanity had been blurred. Sons of the Patriots showed the 2000s as a decade wherein man was fearful of what it meant for technology and humanity to have been joined. And Mr. Robot shows the 2010s as a decade in which man has resolved that he must rewire his world which has fused with technology. When viewed in such a side-by-side -side manner, it becomes apparent just how consistent this cultural progression has been. But more startlingly, how it almost mirrors the five-staged grieving process from the world of flesh and blood. Where the 1980s saw denial, the 1990s saw anger, the 2000s saw depression, and the 2010s saw acceptance. Notably, the third stage, bargaining, cannot be seen, though it should be noted that the Matrix and Sons of Liberty are, in a way, opposite ends of a bargain in that where Neo dealt with technologies through force, Raiden dealt with the technologies through human spirit, and only one of them broke even on that deal. With this realization that our cultural progression has mirrored the five stages, however, one must then wonder, what unknown sixth stage of grief shall we enter in the coming decade?